Pea Ridge Fellowship. It's December 2012. So I'm hoping that we'll do a lot of things tonight. And if we don't get, get it all accomplished, well, I'm going to hand you actually out my notes. What do you think of that? I got some handouts for you. Who would like? Brother Andreessen. He's one that would volunteer to help hand out things. And uh, let's see. Sorrells. Brother Sorrells. Yes. All right. Now. I think I made enough handouts mainly for the adults. There's a three-page handout, okay? And uh, at, least, at least one per family, one per family. And then I have uh, some other books that, uh, this is a really good book when it comes to the King James Version Bible controversy. It's got a lot of things, it's a small book, but it contains a lot of good information. And I like to hand it out when I do Bible conferences, so I'm going to hand this out with you. You hand those out, and then I've got a another book. Actually, it's a little pamphlet because I'm going to talk a little bit about prophecy tonight and show you how uh, uh, the Bible is really a supernatural book. You're, after tonight, if I can get through everything, you're going to say, "Whoa, there's no way somebody wrote this book other than God." Yeah. But this is another little pamphlet it's called "Studying Prophecy." And it talks about all the Old Testament prophecies and then how they're fulfilled in the New Testament. And, uh, of course, no, no way you can possibly cover all that. But uh, that's another handout I'd like to give to everybody, or at least the adults. And here's some more of Brother Pastor And then two books that I would recommend. I'm not... that uh, I'd recommend that you get. They're relatively new. Christ in the Old Testament. It's by uh, James L. Melton. And then that No Flesh of Glory. Those two. Real small pamphlets, but they are, they are very good books. And they'll cover uh, a lot more material than I'm going to cover tonight. Mm -hmm. But uh, very good books. And you can find those at the, at the bookstore. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if you... Okay, if, uh, who didn't get one? If somebody no, brother, brother. Did you this one? I didn't hand those down. No, no. How many did I hand out? You know, if you could have one per family, if somebody would be willing to give one, and then if you didn't get one, just come see me. I, obviously, I have the master, and I'll make you copies, okay? So if you didn't get one. So, now, as far as that's concerned, I'm, I'm done. That's good. Now, I always like to show a couple of uh, object lessons, mostly for the kids, but uh, I like to do them too. So I'll just do a, a couple tonight. First, I want to demonstrate eternal life. Now, some of you who have been in my bookstore have seen, uh, you know, Jesus said, out of your, uh, if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you receive him as your Savior, out of your belly come rivers of living water, right? And uh, what's eternal? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever Belief in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, what What is that everlasting? Well, I'll just give you a demonstration, kind of a demonstration of what that, that's like. Now, this is water in this jug. This is not anything other than water. Okay. I'm just going to pour some out. Kind of reminds you a little bit of what uh, Elijah did uh, for the lady. But, uh, uh, the idea being, if it's eternal, then I could just... Worn out, worn out, and just coming, 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 coming. Turn it Make sure it's in. By the way, Caleb, I've got some work for you to do if you would just give me contact me after the service. <laughs> I better do it now before you run away. No, this is this is not any supernatural thing. This is just a trick. <laughs> I do a trick where I turn um, a penny into a quarter, and that's really good. But when you run out of, you know, you can be a millionaire, but eventually you run out of pennies. So <laughs> So, if you have everlasting life, 
in here tonight, how long is everlasting life? It's everlasting. I try to let the folks in uh, prison understand what everlasting is. Yeah, I know. They seem to think that they can uh, lose everlasting life. I don't see, how, how can you lose everlasting life when it's everlasting? Oh, well, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that trick. I'll show you another trick. Okay, I need, a, I need an assistant. Chris, right? All right, I want you to see that these, there's nothing super wrong with this. Those are just plain, everyday ribbons, right? Correct. Okay. So, let's say this is your finance. You see, her life is a total mess. <laughs> All apart. Here's her, what did I say? Finances. Finances. Here's your, your teacher. Here's your students. <laughs> and wife. Uh, this is your love life, okay? <laughs> but you know, if you give it to Jesus, then Jesus can make it and put it all back together. <laughs> you like that? Check it. It's no trick on those things right there. I'm not telling you there's not a trick somewhere else. <laughs> all right, good. All right, I got We've got to do the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians chapter 6, Brother Strauss, quick to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Mrs. Deems, bring the matches. All right. Now, I've only done this once before. There's no fire detectors or anything in here, right? The fiery darts of the wicked. Where's my Where's my uh, All right, you see? Here's the candle. I right, find out the email. Everybody see that? Blah, blah, blah. You know. Nothing to see here. Okay. You be, you be ready. You be ready. What I'm going to do is blow up the... This is you. Now, you've got Ephesians 6. Read the thing where it talks about the whole armor of God and the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, above all, taking the shield of faith where we, we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Say it loud. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, this is you. No problem. <laughs> Put you in here. This is the what? This is the shield of faith, right? Okay, the candle, please. You see, you're in protection. Now you have to light the candle. <laughs> <laughs> Light the candle. Don't say anything. Light the candle. Are you getting this? That thing looks like it's sideways. <laughs> we might have to go for a commercial break here in a second. Okay. The fiery darts of the wicked. Now he's got the shield of faith. Watch what happens. Will this balloon pop? No, it shouldn't. Oh, I almost caught on fire. Because <laughs> I, I don't have the shield of faith. Get away from my sleeve, okay. okay. Are you getting this on camera? This may never happen ever again. Okay. Okay. Pray that it works going back the other way. Yeah. Now, just to show, it's not a trick balloon. There it is. comes up to the podium afterwards. <laughs> so, Brother Strauss, Brother Andreessen, Brother Dwayne, Brother Drenchies, Brother Dare, make sure, and Brother Santa, make sure you get the fiery, if to evade the fiery darts of wicked, make sure you have the shield of faith. Whole armor of God. Amen. 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 Okay, now let's get into the Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is the Christmas season. We just did a big Christmas parade. And uh, I, thought, I thought we were well received. I thought that went really well. And... Uh, It's a good time of opportunity for Christians to witness. And a lot of times people read the Christmas story 
I want to be in Luke chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole Christmas story, but I want to show something here in Luke chapter 1. And I'll read... Uh, Verse 47. Verse 47. I'll start at verse 46, actually. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help me do a good job for you and your people. Thank the Lord for your provision uh, tonight to have this place for us. I pray, Lord, you give me clarity of speech, clarity of mind, and uh, Lord, it be a blessing to you. And uh, help me do fill, you, fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. All right. Let's do another verse. Go to Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, go to Luke chapter 2, verse 30. This is one of the uh, men in the temple, and uh, Simeon, and he says, verse 30, For my eyes have seen thy salvation. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Do you think all this thing about a Savior and the birth of Jesus Christ is a big surprise to God? I don't think so. It may have been a surprise to the people of the day. It may have been a surprise to the Pharisees and Herod and all these other folks, but it wasn't a surprise to God at all. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. For unto us a child is born. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Verse 5. Let's start at verse 4. A Savior. What kind of Savior? Surely hath borne our sorrows and carried our... Uh, Surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. A Savior, what a great Savior. Now the reason why I put this chart up here is kind of go through the biblical human History. It's actually biblical human misery. <coughs> uh, what happens? Okay. Now let's just start. Why a savior? Why a savior? Well, let's start with that. Um, now, Adam, all he, he needed to do was not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That's all he needed to do. You got one commandment, you're in. Brother Andreessen. One commandment, you're in. Now, Brother Andreessen, tell me. How many sins does it take to become a sinner? One. One. Where do sinners go without Christ? Hell. That's not good, is it? <laughs> no, that's not, that's not good. Jesus said, hell is a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Well, Adam and Eve both made a big boo-boo. How, uh, how did that uh, plan of salvation work for them? Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. How did that plan work for them? Not so good. They, they, they kind of bombed out, didn't they? And they got kicked out of the garden. All right. So, about a thousand years transpires, and man is, go to Genesis chapter 6. I'll just, I'll just show you Genesis chapter 6, what God thought of, of man. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, they were living under a plan of, of conscience, you know, the law written in their hearts. As long as you do right, you're in there. Well, by the time we get to Noah, what did God say about man? What did God say about man? He's a total flop. 
In fact, he's so bad and he's so wicked that God wipes out everything in a flood. That's why he needed Noah. So then uh, it says, well, okay, we'll start again. Noah, three boys, Shem, Ham, Japheth, build an ark. They make it through the flood to get on the other side. And life is good. They're going to start all over again. Right, right Brother Jason? So it appears. So it appears. But you know what? Almost, uh, almost like the next chapter, Noah gets drunk. Ham uncovers the naked or sees the nakedness of his father. And the next thing you know, life is going real bad. They end up in a thing called the Tower of Babel. And God has to confuse their languages. How are we doing so far under conscience, under works? Not so good. How many sins does it take to make a sinner? One. And where do sinners go without Christ? Pick out a, we're going to pick out a guy, Abraham. And we're going to start all over again. And he's a promise. And we're going to make a great nation of Abraham. Right? Abraham leaves the Earl of Chaldees. Of course, he, he took Lot and his father with him. But eventually he gets down there. And then he has to end up, there's a famine, he goes down to Egypt. And what happens to his family? The family ends up in slavery. 430 years. Uh, go to the end of Genesis. <clears throat> How does Genesis end? These guys are all living. There's no written law yet. There's no written law until Moses. These guys are all living under the law, all written in their hearts. And they're all failing miserably. Horribly. Horribly. It means it's getting, it's getting, it's fine. I mean, here's a chosen man, chosen people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 12 tribes, life, and they end up in slavery. But here's how Genesis ends. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. How would you like that to be for the ending? Not going for you, is it, Brother Dare? No, I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, you know what we'll do? We'll escape Egypt. I'll get Moses as my guy. We'll get you out into the desert. I'll give you a law. And, well, here's, uh, here's the Gentile. They start 4,000. They're going to go forever. We've got the Jews started under Abraham. Now they're giving the law unto Moses. And he says, you know, those pagans, those pagan heathens have been doing the sacrifices and all this stuff all wrong, and it's just been a miserable experience for me. They Now they're worshiping idols, and they're uh, uh, sacrificing the devils and all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to codify the law. This is how I want to do uh, the sacrifices. This is how one shall live, and life is going to be great. Uh, how did that turn out? They end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Getting, getting bit by snakes and life not very good. Eventually, you get into the land under Joshua. Eventually, you get into the land of uh, Israel through Joshua. But it doesn't take long after Joshua that you end up in the book of Judges. Anybody study the book of Judges lately? How does that turn out? What's the end in the book of Judges? What does it say? And every man does... Like that which is right in his own eyes. Yeah. Not working very good. Well, you have uh, Saul. Saul is called uh, out. Of course, you know, he bombs out. He tries to kill David. He goes in with the witch of Endor. Finally, he ends up dying, and the uh, Ark of the Covenant is stolen, all this stuff. So God says, Well, I'll pick another guy. I'll pick David. And man, we're going to do some good stuff with David. Under the law. It's good stuff with David. How many sins does it take to become a sinner? Just one. Just one. And where do sinners go without Jesus Christ? They go to hell. They go to hell. It's not, it's not going good. It's not going good. <sighs> Turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Second Samuel. You all know the story. Was it Second Samuel chapter one? I guess it is Second Samuel chapter one. David should have been in a war. He looks out his window, he sees Bathsheba. He commits adultery and murder. Not good. I left out a guy here named Job. Job was probably around right around Abraham. 
right? Uh, we will turn to there. Turn to Job. What was Job's problem? Self-righteousness. Oh, who said that? Self-righteousness. Oh, excuse me. Self-righteousness. Is that a good thing? No, that's not a good thing. Self-righteousness gets you nowhere with God. Amen. Job says, uh, where does he say it? I've got it here. Oh, yeah. Job chapter 42. Look at verse 5. This is a self-righteous man, right? He looks at himself compared to God, and God's been talking to him for about five chapters. He says, here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare unto, uh, thou unto me, God says. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The self-righteous thing ain't going very well. Because people aren't self-righteous. Now you run into self-righteous. I, I run into prison all the time. I run into self-righteous people all the time. It ain't working very good. So, uh, David, he bombs out, so we start with Solomon. How about Solomon? How does he do? You know, Solomon's the guy who wrote this. Go to Ecclesiastes. See, Solomon's going to restart everything. He says, man, everything, we've got peace in the, we got peace, and life is good. He writes all these proverbs, says, hey, we're going to be righteous, we're going to do all this good stuff, we're going to do this great stuff. And then he gets to Ecclesiastes, and he says, verse, uh, what is it, the last chapter, verse 12, verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He says, hey, this is your duty. Fear God. Keep the commandments. That's easy. Don't have to worry about a single thing. And we're going to bring in all these good things for our people. Life is going to be good. Everything's going to go smooth. We'll all be rich. Fear God. Keep the commandments. Boy, aren't you glad you don't live under that? Amen. You know why? Because you can't keep that. Amen. Solomon did. You talk about Muhammad having a, having self not having self-control. How about... Uh, how about Solomon? He had to have a thousand wives. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, within a generation, the kingdom is split in half. And they eventually end up, one kingdom goes uh, under the Syrians, the other, uh, other kingdom goes into the uh, Babylonians. So we're up to around 600 B.C. now. And uh, we already read this one verse. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Yeah. This is what uh, Isaiah has to say about when he looks back at human history or human, human misery. Looks back at the Jewish nation which was given the law, given all the commandments. Isaiah 53, verse 5. <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. For our transgressions, for our iniquities. Nobody's, the self-righteous thing ain't working very well. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. All we, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then Daniel talks about, um, when you go to the book of Daniel, and he was under the Babylonian captivity, Daniel talks about all the iniquities and sins of his people. You get to the end, you get about 400 uh, B.C. It's the, when Malachi is written. And what you have there is uh, the Old Testament is done. Canon is finished. And within 100 years, the Gentiles decide they don't want to even deal with the Old Testament. 
they come up with three characters called Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato. And they take us all the way to the time of Christ. The Gentiles are a total fouled up mess. The Jews are a total fouled up mess. Now let's go back to Adam. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. Let's talk about them for a little bit. Just because something is not visible doesn't mean that it's not there. I'm going to put this out here. Now what, now see, I'm holding that up here. Now what you don't see is the center of gravity. Another thing you don't see, Brother Dwayne, is radio waves. When was the last time you saw a radio wave? How about gravity? You don't even know what it is. When was the last time you saw infrared? You guys can't see infrared. You can only see visible light. You can feel infrared, but you can't see it. How about x-rays? Uh, you know, before 1950, we thought that there was only one galaxy in the world, in the universe. That was our galaxy in 1950. Since that time, we've discovered many, 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 many more galaxies. Just because you didn't know that there was many, 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 more and more galaxies out there, does that mean that it wasn't there? Let's go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve said, God told them, don't eat of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Remember that? Don't eat of the tree. But they did. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember, we started this off with some uh, verses on the Savior. Savior. Uh, have I made a case that these, guys, these folks need a Savior? <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Verse uh, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Boom! Sinner! Boom! Right there. How's, works, how's, how's, how's that work salvation work for you, Brother Sarouse? Not so good. You're done for. Ah, but maybe I'm not done for. Look at verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now what what's the school's what's the school answer? What is those fig leaves? What's that? Self-righteousness. Self what does God think of that self-righteousness? Those fig leaves? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. All our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. You're still in the world of hurt. You're done for. You got sin on you, and your righteousness, God, you're going to care one bit about it. All our righteousness is filthy rags. Exactly right. That's out of Isaiah. So, look here. Uh-oh. You know, God made provision for Adam and Eve, and they didn't even know it. You know what the provision was? An animal skin. Yeah, Brother Andreessen. They didn't know about it. Do you think it caught God by surprise that they were going to eat in the tree of knowledge, good and evil, Brother Strauss? I don't think so, John. How about you back there, Brother Dickens? No, I don't think so. How do I know that? Because look here. Uh, somewhere in here. <laughs> What did he say? Uh, he made him want animal skin somewhere. Which verse is that? 21. 21, yeah, okay. 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, in order to have coats of skins, what must I do, Brother Sundimer? You raise animals? If I want to get a coat of skin from one of your animals, what must I do? I must kill it. I must shed what? Blood. Ah. Uh -huh. Now, guess what that blood, guess what that lamb's, God accepted that. It was a what? Covering. Yes. Now you got a shot. Now you got a shot. Turn to Leviticus chapter, I think, 17, verse 10. 
Now you got a shot. Now you got a shot. The Old Testament saints, under the law, they're all under the law under here. Whether it's the law of conscience or the law of, uh, of Moses, it's a law you're written in their hearts, the law of Moses. They all are sinners. They can try to be self-righteous. They ain't going to make it. Job was the best. He didn't make it. But they need a covering. And here's why. Leviticus 17, verse 11. We, we preach this. We teach this. So you know this already. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. Blood makes an atonement for the souls. When Old Testament saints died, where'd they go? Did they go up? No. No. They went down, didn't they? Now, why do you think they went down, Brother Dreesen? Christ had not been right. The blood of the bulls and goats could can never, never take away sin. Acts, absolutely. The blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, but it was a covering. God accepted it until the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9. I call Hebrews chapter 9 the center of the Bible because it tells the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, hey, who made animal sacrifices? Adam, Noah, Job, Abram. Moses, David, they all Gentiles. Go to Job. I'll show you. Go to Job. Why did Job make animal sacrifices? And you see right away, somebody said Job's problem was self-righteousness. I'll tell you, you can see it right in here. Um, look at verse 5. Job chapter 1 verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning, sung by his children, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have what? Sin. Brother Andreessen, I ask you again. How many sins does it take to become a sinner? One. And where does a sinner go without Jesus Christ? Hell. Hell. Not a good thing bad situation. So, Job is putting a covering on his children. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. That's the joke. But you know something there, brother? He did not offer up a sin for himself. Why didn't he? Because he didn't think he needed it. And so Job sends him a little test to where at the end of Job he says, ah, I abhor myself. I'm not, I'm not righteous. <coughs> All right. Now, let's see our handouts. That's an overview. So just because a thing is not apparent does not necessarily mean it doesn't exist. I'll show you another example. Go to Isaiah, uh, Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. How are we doing? Doing all right? Unto us is born a Savior. You know, it's great to have Jesus Christ come to this earth. Not just, not just because he came as a baby, because he was going to be the Savior. He was going to be the blood sacrifice that was going to pay for the sins of the whole world. You can't beat that. And you can't write that. There's no other brand X religion has anything like that. See, every brand X religion says, I'll weigh your good against your bad. See? We'll throw in a little this and a little of that. But ultimately, when you get to the top, it's your works that get you there. Amen. You can't get there by your works. Yep. The only way you get there, the only way you get to heaven, is through Jesus Christ. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. you got a supernatural book here. I've been, from the beginning, for 4,000 years, I've told you that biblical human history. It ain't been good, but I've showed you the solution to the sin problem. Why do we need a Savior? Why do we need a blood sacrifice of a Savior? Because we're sinners. Genesis chapter 34. No, I don't want to be Genesis. I think it's 22. Yeah, Genesis 22. Genesis 22. 
Again, here's the type. You got Abraham is told by God, take your son Isaac up to the top of the mountain and you offer him up to me. But Abraham says, hey, he'll come back again. I'm not worried. What does he say? He says, uh, verse 8, 22 verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now Isaac doesn't understand this <coughs> sacrifice. I'm not sure Abraham really knew there was going to be a ram up there at the top of the thicket. But Abraham is a type of God the Father. <coughs> Isaac is a type of the sinner. Hello? Did you just... I know you're probably dozing right now. Isaac is a type of the sinner. He's got to take the wood up there. That's the burden of the sin. He gets bound up, and he's about ready to be killed and burned as a sacrifice. He's a type of the sinner. You know why I know that? Because Isaac doesn't die. Why doesn't he die? Because there's a substitute made. That substitute is what? A ram caught in a thicket. Oh, I wonder who that typifies. Jesus Christ. Isaac type of sinner. He doesn't have to go to hell. Or he doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to be sacrificed because the ram is there. You don't have to go to hell. Why? Because you have a substitute. A blood sacrifice. Jesus Christ. Now, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I've talked to Brother Sarras about this, so I won't ask you. Let's pretend this is a knife. Brother Andreessen, I used to beat up here in you and hunger. I can't beat him up anymore. Come up here. I'm going to kill you right now. Amen. <laughs> Let me show you. I'm going to explain to you something. I, I ain't going to get through any of this, uh, all this stuff, so you got the handouts. I ain't. Okay. Just pretend he's laying down, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned. Condemned already. You believe it not, the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Something like this. The light is coming to the world, the men love Dr. Something like that. <laughs> now, for God so loved the world, and yet this guy is under condemnation. How can this be, Brother Dreesen? How can this guy be under wrath of God while at the same time? Let me ask you this. In this story, with Isaac, did Abraham love his son? He sure did. He's got the knife. He's getting ready to kill him, isn't he? He's under the wrath of Abraham. Isaac's under the wrath of Abraham. He's going to kill him. Why is he going to kill the son that he loves? Hmm? Why? God told him to. It's a commandment. For the wages of sin is death. Hell was prepared for who? That was it. It wasn't prepared for sinners. But if you're God, you've got to put him somewhere. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. I love this guy. But you know what? You're a sinner, Jason. <laughs> and love has nothing to do with it. <laughs> I gotta kill you. So do you get that? Uh, you know, people don't understand uh, regular English. Is this wall, brother? I mean, is this wall painted, brother? Yes. Oh, I meant Sundheimer. Is this, is this wall painted, brother? Sundheimer. You mean it was painted? You mean it was painted? But it's painted. Are you saved, brother? And Jason? Yes, you're saved. You, you mean you were saved? You is saved. In present tense. I was, I is, and I was. So how, so how can you use it? See, it's a past tense word used in the present. I think that's a, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's present perfect, I think. You can find it in the Greek, I think. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Am I right? So you think I don't know some stuff. <laughs> Are you sanctified? I am. You were, you is sanctified. I was, I is sanctified. When did 
God love the world, he asks. We're at Christmas time. I can, I can kind of go on the radical right fringe of biblical Christianity. Can I? Just a little bit? Huh? You got a little grace? What goes around a Pea Ridge stays around a Pea Ridge? Uh -oh. Go to John chapter 3. It's a present perfect. You got all kinds of words like that. That's why the new versions mess with those words. They say you were saved instead of are saved. I am crucified with Christ. Well, what, I got saved, you know, when I was 13. But present tense, I am crucified. Just like that wall's painted. Got that? John 3.16. Let's just, let's just, this is one of the, the most popular favorite verses of the whole universe. John 3.16. How much time left on that camera? You got 42 minutes into it. 42 minutes? It's into it. Oh, 42 minutes into it? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. I got till, I got till 7.30. All right. <laughs> I got another. Here. Get this. We're going to do this in two phases. I'm gonna, anyway, you can open that up and get ready to give that to this brother over here. All right. All right. Where was I? John 3.16. Famous verse. Uh, Tim Tebow used to put it on his helmet or whatever, on his cheeks or whatever. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When did Jesus Christ... Sister Gilly, you are a Bible student, I know. When did he say that? John 3.16. Did he say that after Calvary or before Calvary? He said it before. Now how can you say something like that? He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Brother Dwayne. He hadn't died yet. How did that happen? Maybe it's that present perfect showing up again. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins or something. I probably put two verses together. We love God because he first loved us. Well, when did he start loving us? Was it back here in Adam? I mean, it didn't surprise him that Adam and Eve would sin, did it? I trow not. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is what? Given. So it had to be around, uh, what, 600 B.C.? Whenever Isaiah wrote 500 B.C.? Can we go back a little further? I just showed you the type in Isaiah. So we're back to, I mean, uh, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so we're back to 1500 B.C. Can we go back any further than that? For God so loved the world. When did God start loving the world, the sinner, to provide for the, the baby Jesus on Christmas morn? Anybody got a verse? Think. Think, 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 think. Ah, Brother Andreessen, he's got it. And you'll never guess, it's in the worst place you'd ever want to find that type of thing. Before the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13. Bum, 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 bum. Go to Revelation 13. Alright. Uh, yeah, I just, I just raised Brother and Jesus from the dead. There you go. Hey, Amen. You need the resurrection. Yeah. Revelation 13 verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Oh my goodness. Lamb! Slain when? Before the foundation of the world. How far back is that, Brother Sirach, you think? Pretty far back. They didn't catch God by accident that these folks in the Old Testament would be such doom cause. And you know what? It didn't surprise God at all that the people in this age would be doing cross either. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Uh, we read, we read uh, a lot of the Pauline epistles, don't we? And we read 
read about Ephesians, we read Galatians, we read uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, we read these. Uh, and Romans. Romans is really good. And a lot of times we look at these books and we say, boom, Paul's looking back, he's what, 70 AD or whatever, and he looks back and as far as he can see is the cross. He don't look back here. Is that true? When he's writing Romans chapter 3 and says there's none righteous, no, not one. Do you think he stops right here at the cross? The Calvary? I trow not. He says in, he says in Romans chapter 2, he says, by continuous and well-doing, they seek for eternal life. But by Romans chapter 3, he looks at the human history and he says... None made it. The only way to make it in the Old Testament, get a covering of blood. And the only way you make it in the New Testament is get the covering of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why the Old Testament is called the law. Old Testament, under law. And the New Testament, what do they say? Grace. Because it's a total gift. Amen? Total gift. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now let's, with that as a background, let's talk a little bit about this chart over here to the left. And you've got your handout. You should have your handout. show you, that if you want to call it the foreknowledge of God, the provision of God, look at your first chart here. You've got Egypt, you got the Sinai, and you got the history of mankind. The Jews traveling from Egypt to the Sinai into Jerusalem pictures not only the history of mankind, Gentile, Jew, under the law, and the church age, but it also pictures the history of Israel. It started out under Abram, which was a Gentile. They got under the law, but what's the Jew eventually going to have to turn to? Not Moses, but they're going to have to go to what? Jerusalem. They have to go to the promised land, and who do they find? Who is crucified in the promised land, Jesus Christ. Here you have Pharaoh, here you have Moses, and here you have Jesus Christ. Here you have paganism, here you have the law, and here you have the church. Here the Jews are under slavery. Here under the law they're under works. When they get to Calvary, they're under grace, and they're under faith. They used to, the Egyptians used to worship Isis. When the, Jews left Isis, when the Jews left Egypt, they got into the Sinai, they started worshiping God the Father. But who eventually are they going to have to worship, like after the tribulation and during the millennium? Jesus Christ. How about, how about us as sinners? We start off as pagans and heathens. How many can attest to that? Amen. Amen. Pagans and heathens doing all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> and then something clicks. He said, you know what? I'm on my way to hell. All this sin. So I'm going to clean up. So you put yourself under the wall. And you try to reform yourself. Right? Amen. You see in prison, Brother Dwayne, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People in prison, they try to reform themselves. 
In fact, they try to reform themselves so much under works that they want to reform before they get saved. The law can only condemn you. It can never justify you. Never. Ever. Never. Why? How many sins does it take to become a sinner? Just one. Just one. And where do sinners go without Jesus Christ? Hell. Hell. This is one of my new volunteers. I want him to get this. <laughs> yeah, the pyramids. Yeah, the tabernacle. This is on your handout, by the way. The Egyptian handout. The tabernacle. But up here you have the cross of Calvary. And on and on it goes. You end up with the bones of Egypt. And the bones of Joseph in Egypt. You have the Ark of the Law in Sinai. But then the body of Christ. <laughs> that Bible was written. I'm telling you what, you've got a supernatural book. You cannot write it with a writing machine. It is too supernatural. Okay? What I've just showed you, six and a half billion people on the planet. What I've just showed you, six and a half billion people on the planet do not have an idea what we just talked about tonight. Zero, not enough. Miss here? It's sad. <coughs> when you're lost, you're, you're in the world. When you're under the law, you're a wanderer. When you get saved, you're promised the kingdom. Amen. Uh, here's an interesting thing I thought about. Here's Python. It's interesting. This name of one of the cities is Python. That's the name of a snake, isn't it? In the wilderness, what they do? They put a stake and they put a serpent on the stake, didn't they? See, this one won't do any good. This one at least healed you. How about this one? They put Jesus Christ on a cross. I'm a worm. And he brings salvation. Notice, and I don't have time to go into this, but they, every time in your Bible, well, maybe I do have time. Every time in your Bible, there's a major change in your Bible, somebody crosses water. How are we doing on time? 53 minutes. Three in, minutes? Into it. 53 minutes into it. Okay. I don't, there's no countdown. Did you, get the, did you give her the new tape? There it is. <laughs> Great job. I mean, this stuff, I, I want to get this on, on uh, Vimeo. Okay. Because six and a half billion people don't know this stuff. Every time there's a major event in the Bible, somebody crosses water. I suspect there was water here. How about Noah? Water. Uh, how about Abram? Tigris Euphrates, right? Uh, Moses had to cross the Red Sea. David, the book of Kidron. Uh, Jesus Christ got baptized, what, in the Jordan, right? And he goes back and forth. David, uh, the book of Kidron, blah, blah, blah. There's even a, uh, uh, a flood in the book of Revelation. Every time there's water in your Bible, you pay attention. Because it signifies something that's changing. From Old Testament to New Testament. Who shows up before Jesus Christ? John the who? Baptist. Something, something about change. Something about change. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Let's see. Did you give me that? Next handout. All right. We'll go through this quickly. On the left side, you've got a picture, a, a bird's eye view of the Old Testament tabernacle, which they had in the wilderness. You know about it. You have the brazen altar, which is a picture of uh, Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. God never uses a sacrifice that he don't kill and burn. Hint, hint, hint. God doesn't use any sacrifice that he doesn't kill or he doesn't burn. So guess what Jesus Christ had to do? He had to die, and he had to be burned. Amen? What does Acts chapter 2 say? My, it talks about Jesus Christ going to hell. What's hell like? Tell me, Brother Andreessen, what's hell like? Hot. Very hot. <laughs> Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, right? Is there any place in the Bible that says hell is anything other than a place where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched? Any place? God will never... Hey, guess what's going to happen to you if he's going to use you? 
You're going to go through the fire. You got Brother Dickens back there. He's been through the fire. How do I know that? Because he's God's using him. It's in England. Anybody? Anybody God's going to use, Brother Dwayne? You're going to go through the fire. You're going to get sprinkled in blood, and, God, and God's going to put you in the fire. All right. Then you have the labor here. That's a picture of washing. You got the table of showbread. You got the candlestick over here. Showbread is like the Word of God. Show, uh, the, light, the candlestick is like the Holy Spirit. You've got the altar and incense, like prayer. Then you've got you go into the Holy of Holies, and there's the Ark of the Covenant. But on top of the Ark of the Covenant is what? The mercy seat. Aren't you glad for that? Here's the mercy seat, and here's the Ark. What does the Ark contain? The law. Can anybody get saved keeping the law? No. So you need mercy. You need that covering. So, guess what that high priest does every once a year? He puts blood on the mercy seat. If law was over top of mercy, guess what happened to every one of us in here? We would toast like marshmallows in hell. If God's mercy wasn't bigger than his law, we'd all be dead. For God so loved the world. When did God love the world? From the foundation of the world. Amen. Uh, why does God love? Here's a question. That's one of his attributes. It comes natural for him. Huh? What did Jesus Christ say for us to do? Let's see, pick somebody. Brother Drake. I caught you. Oh, you're getting a pen. Okay. <laughs> Brother Drake. What did God, what? What was my question? Uh, <laughs> see, it can confuse me. Uh, okay. What did Jesus Christ tell us to do for our enemies? With our enemies? Pray for them. Pray for them. Love, Love them. our enemies. Now, if you're God out in eternity and you want to show an attribute, of yourself, Sister Andreessen, which is love, you gotta make some enemies. You gotta make some enemies to love. And what's the ultimate way of showing your love? Dying for them, right? Right? So uh, for the last 6,000 years, guess what God's been doing? <laughs> guess what we've been doing? <laughs> See, we're part of this plan. We've been providing God with enemies. <laughs> All right, enough said on that. Okay, so anyway, can you imagine this tabernacle? When they were doing this tabernacle in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, they had oh no idea that this was a type of Calvary, or that this was a washing, or this was a type of the Word of God, or this was the Holy Spirit, or this was prayer, or that this was the law being overcome by mercy, which ultimately is overcome by blood. They had no idea that. They were just told to do it, and they did it. They were like this. Ooh, the knees were shaking. Were shaking. Why, brother and Jesus? Because how many sins does it take to become a sinner? You're one. The, one. <laughs> they were shaking in their boots. When they died, they went down, brother Shrouse. They didn't go up. Did anybody in the Old Testament have eternal security like you did? Would anybody in the Old Testament in the body of Christ like you are? No. Rough system. Be under a law. Rough. Well, this is a picture of your salvation in Christ. A picture. Twice a day, the, high, the priest would go in there and offer up an offering for you. And once a year, a day of atonement, they would take a goat, two goats. One goat would go out. The other goat they'd kill. Boom. And that was to cover the sins of the people. As long as you stayed in the camp, you were in. But if you got kicked out of the camp, for murder or adultery or being a juvenile delinquent. Don't be a juvenile delinquent. You got kicked out, and guess what? I don't know what happened, but it wasn't good. You get kicked out. Why do they think they're worried about being kicked out of the synagogue in Jesus' time? Huh? 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 Because they wouldn't be under the covering. The burnt offering, the peace offering, and the meat offering were voluntary. This is like John 3.16. This had to do with your salvation. This had to do with your sanctification. Sanctification.
congregation or your fellowship. You see, I might make an offense against my wife. It's covered under the this thing, but I have no way to clear my conscience. So the Lord provided a way of, day, of where you could offer up things, either your sin or trespass offering, you could offer them up, and it would be a way of clearing your conscience before God. Where have we seen that before? 1 John 1 9. Let's say you want to you totally commit and dedicate your life to, to God, you provide a per, burnt offering. Let's say you want to have fellowship. You want to get inside the tabernacle. You want to be as close to God as you possibly could. You'd offer up a peace offering. And you can actually eat, go inside this area here where it's separated. And you can actually spend time with the priest and be close to God. And meat was a consecration of your works. I'm going to dedicate my works. Again, 1,500 years before Christ ever shows up. Here's a system set up. They had no idea what the types were. They just did it. But isn't that amazing? You've got a book that is so amazing. The, the Quran can't, ha can't handle it. Buddha can't handle it. Nobody can handle it. This book is above anything that man could ever write. Okay. Now the last thing. Go to the last handout. Please. My wife says, make sure you say please. All right. Brother Sorrells and Brother Andrews, if you would put this banner up here. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. And we're closing up here. I know I had a. Sum it up. Long race. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us all. James, can somebody read me James 2.10? Please. For whose rubber shall keep the whole law, and then instead of one point, he is still to your Okay, the idea is you take the clip and you have to. Somebody has to take the clip off. There you go. And put it up there. There you go. Very good. Now, all right. Now, Brother Strauss. Oh, you're too small. <laughs> All right, that will stay up. You go over there. See, I used to be an officer in the Air Force. It's not showing right now, but I used to be. And, uh, all right. All right, it's good enough. Okay. Here it is. The Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world. Thank you, gentlemen. Sort of. Right. So, say that James 2.10 again, please. For whose lover shall keep the whole law, and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. Guilty of all! Man, the law is just, it doesn't give me any second chance. Anybody tries to mix faith and works, or grace and, and the law, or whatever, it just don't work. Because you make one boo-boo. How many boo-boos does it take to become a sinner, Brother Andreessen? One. One. And where do sinners go without Christ? Hell. You can tell I have fun in prison <coughs> pretty good, man. Over here, you can be nothing but a sinner. 
under the law. You can be nothing but a sinner. But under grace, you can be a saint. You are a saint. You is a saint. You are saved. Amen. Under the law, there was a promise. Under the law, there was a promise. Go to Romans chapter 1. I'll show you. Under the law, there's a promise. Paul talks about it. It's as plain as day. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Did that mean that the Holy Pro that, did that mean that the prophets knew about it? Not necessarily, but he promised it. We can look back and we can see the promises. I just showed you two of the big examples. He promised. He promised. Amen. He promised Abraham, make your father of many nations. I promise. And that son was going to come through Isaac. I promise. What did he say to Adam and Eve in the garden? There's going to be a seed. But did they understand that Jesus Christ would one day come, be born as a baby, and uh, live 33 years on this earth and then die a wicked death on the cross? No. Nobody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the cross. They were shaking in their boots. Because they were what? Sinners. And the only thing they had covering for them was <laughs> blood, which could never take away sin. They knew that. They were smarter than the average Joe. Well, let's just finish up with this. If you want to call the Old Testament kind of a... By the way, one of these guys goes, goes to hell, and one of them guy goes to heaven. Eventually, right? What's the difference between the two men? What's the difference? One, go, one, one of the thieves goes down to hell, and one eventually makes it to heaven. What's the difference between the two men? One has Christ. It's not, I'm not, it's not a trick. One, one has Christ, the other one doesn't. This guy's a thief, and this guy's a thief. Did I spell that right, Sister uh, Cagle? They're both thieves. One gets to heaven, one goes. What's the difference? Why? Jesus Christ. Nobody gets to heaven, starting with Adam all the way to the end of time, without the blood of Jesus Christ which he had promised before of his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Let's talk about courtship. Old Testament was a courtship. Calvary was a demonstration. Now my wife, before I met her, I loved her. She knew I loved her. In fact, she cost me a lot of money on telephone bills because I loved her. But you know what? She really didn't believe I loved her until the wedding day. And I gave her the ring. And now, for the last 30 years, there has been provision. She is convinced now that I love her. Romans 5.8 But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 4. 4, 5, and 6. Mark this down in your Bible. Put a star by it. Hello, very important. Back there. Ephesians 2, 4, 5, 6. Because what you have is God's mercy, grace, and love. God's mercy. You don't get what you deserve. You deserve hell. 
You're not going there, Brother Strauss. God's grace. You get something you didn't earn, you didn't work for. That's God's grace. You know where you're going when you die, Brother? Yes, sir. Where? Heaven. Heaven! You didn't work for that. You didn't give one iota, not one inkling of work for that. Old Testament, under the law, they went down. Their self-righteousness sent them down. What got them to heaven was a blood covering and then the blood of the Lamb, Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy, great love. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, 5, 6. But God... So it always starts with God. Now, I didn't show you that thing there, but it always starts with God. God, it always starts with God. God has grace, unmerited favor. He gives you His Word. It's up to you to believe it or not. That's called faith. When you believe it, faith will produce obedience. Obedience will produce good works. James says it. Faith out works dead. Faith always produces good works, and good works always produces blessings. Hello? From Adam all the way to now, that's the way it works. God hadn't changed. God, grace, His word, your faith, your obedience, produces good works, produces blessings. Now, Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, you couldn't invent this. I'm telling you, folks, nobody in this right, Shakespeare couldn't invent this stuff. But I just showed you tonight. And six and a half billion people are dying and going to hell because they, they either don't read the book, they don't want to believe it, or whatever. The Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, now, what does the next verse say? Five. Brother Strauss, read that for me. Verse five. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. I don't want to have to kill Brother Andreessen again. <laughs> I don't want to kill Brother Jason again. You can be under the condemnation of God, the wrath of God, because you're a sinner. Love has nothing to do with it, as far as the judgment. But if you have the blood of Christ on you, I tell the guys in prison, you get the blood of Christ on you, I don't care how you get it on. How you pray, what you say, what you do, you get the blood of Christ on you, and you're in. Woo! Now, who, who quickened who? hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. See, it's not your merit. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a Savior. Amen? Yeah. When they talked about it in Luke, they said, we need a Savior. Here comes, here comes the Savior. Here comes the Savior. Now, they were probably speaking prophetically. They may not even understood what they were saying. They're probably thinking, well, maybe we get saved from the Romans. But the Scriptures capitalizes it. Savior. Go back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and then we'll close. Like I said, if you didn't get all the handouts, um, please uh, come up and, and let me know, and I'll make you a copy. I'll give it to you tomorrow. You want to put a star by this verse. This was... Well prior to Jesus Christ ever coming. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's a promise yet to come. It's coming. Just like all this other stuff. We're at the tail end of this thing. We're at 6,000 years of human history, human misery, human history, whatever you want to call it. We're about ready to Going past the tribulation, rapture of the tribulation, and into the womb. Yeah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of
of peace. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this book, this precious book, the King James Version Bible, from which we can get so much information. And uh, you laid it out. The universe runs by this book. I'm convinced of it. In fact, you, you, uh, you uh, say in the beginning, God. Uh, and uh, you're the beginning, you're the end. We thank you, Lord, for your book. We thank you, Lord, for um, your scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for what you've shown us from the scriptures. We thank you we have a comfort and a confidence in our salvation because of these things that we talked about tonight. We thank you, Lord, for uh, all the men that sacrificed and, and died to give us this book. We pray, Lord, that we treasure it like we should. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.